and welcome to episode three of Ben's Camera Show. Completely commercial free, unsponsored and unmonetized. Till I get enough viewers. And uh, what a show we've got for you tonight. Oh my goodness. Or, or, or uh, this afternoon if you're in America. Or this morning if you're in California. I already did that gag in, uh, in the first show. But tonight we have an amazing show because we're going to talk about Kodachrome. Yes, Kodachrome. Kodachrome. And in fact, um, we're going to talk about Kodachrome. We're going to talk about sound film, which kind of ties in with Kodachrome. We're going to talk about developing negative. We're going to talk about developing reversal. And we're going to be talking to a very special guest, Mr. Adrian Cousins, will be joining us later. So we're very excited about that. Uh, but before I uh, launch into all the technicalities and the geekery and all the rest of it, I think some of you may need a little bit of a refresher about what Kodachrome is and why it is such uh, an amazing stock, film stock. Now, Kodachrome, I'm going to go over to, the, uh, to my little box in the corner where I, where I spend most of the show. Ah, I'm on twice. How did that happen? <laughs> Anyway, Kodachrome, classic, classic Kodachrome. That picture you might have seen, that was done on Kodachrome. And um, it was invented, well, okay, the term Kodachrome was uh, invented actually a little bit earlier than 1935, but Kodachrome as a film stock uh, came about in 1935, which makes it, uh, well, it was discontinued in um, 2005, so that gives it a 74-year lifespan, which is insane. And um, I think none other than the great Paul Simon put it best when he said, I want a photo opportunity, I need a shot of redemption, don't want to end up a cartoon in a t cartoon graveyard. And I think that um, of all his lyrics, those, those best sum up the current state of, uh, of Kodachrome today. Um, it started in 1935 with something just called Kodachrome 1, I guess you could call it now, but at the time it was just called Kodachrome. And then in 1961 came something called Kodachrome 2. And then, which uh, had uh, better sensitivity and better colors. And then in uh, 1974, was released Kodachrome 25, which is 25 ASA, and um, Kodachrome 40, which is the, uh, the one that most of you are familiar with if you've shot this on Super 8. So let's get the, uh, get the classic pictures off before I, uh, I get done for some kind of uh, copyright infringement. Anyway, so 1973, sorry, this, this regular Kodachrome 40 came out, followed in 1974, by Kodachrome Sound. And you'll notice straight away that the Kodachrome Sound cartridge is a slightly different size to the regular Kodachrome cartridge. And I'll be going into all of that later. Now, like I said, it was discontinued in, um, 19, in 2005. Um, they gave out a few more years during which it was still uh, developed. And then in uh, 2011, the last lab in the world, which was called Dwayne's Photo, stopped developing it. And in fact, uh, they stopped taking orders uh, at the end of 2010. And there was a mad rush of people to uh, get their films in finally to be developed before uh, they ceased developing. And you might think, well, people are developing their own film at home. Doesn't matter if the labs close. Oh yes, it matters. It matters because, because Kodachrome utilized a very interesting and archaic um, uh, developing process, which was called K14. And there's a uh, there's a, uh, a a guy called Ronald Andrew put together this uh, very nice PowerPoint where you where he detailed exactly what's involved in developing a role of Kodachrome. Before we get into that, you have to know about thing about Kodachrome is it's not it's not strictly speaking color film or color emulsion. What it is is it's like three uh, maybe four different color different black and white emulsions, 
which when going when after go <laughs> I'll start again when they went through the process of developing a roll of Kodachrome, each black and white layer, see if I can get through here, so uh, was actually exposed, uh, was actually uh, developed in a different color, to put it simply. And uh, it's step number two here, uh, they do a black and white developing. This is a cross sections of uh, actual film emulsions. Um, and then other things happens like they had to expose red light to it through the base, not through the top, but th through the emulsion, but through the base. Um, and then uh, the cyan developer, then blue light from the front, and then the yellow yellow developer, then the magenta, uh, which uh, had a chemical fogging process. And um, then there was some bleach where uh, silver had to be uh, dissolved out and then fixing. Finally, here you have your, uh, your color image. Um, well, it's, <laughs> it's complicated. It was 14 steps. And uh, to be honest, the, um, the process involved some chemicals which are impossible to replicate these days. I don't think even Kodak could make them again because they've junked all their equipment. Not only that, but um, some of the uh, some of the production of Kodachrome and some of the developing of Kodachrome uh, involved some rather toxic chemicals. Um, the clue is in the word chrome. <laughs> um, chromium is a, a heavy metal, and it's been known to um, cause uh, you know environmental damage when it gets thrown away. So, yeah, there was a basically ectochrome and other other emulsions came in, which were um, which had their own color dyes incorporated in the emulsion. And then people could finally start just shooting and developing using much, much easier to operate equipment. So there's a little history uh, about Kodachrome and you have to know the history of it and you have to know the, uh, the, uh, the way it works in order to understand some of the things I'm going to tell you tonight. Oh, it's called non-substantive or non-incorporated like I said. So think of like a bunch of black and white emulsions which have things called color couplers, which is a special chemical that comes in and only reacts to uh, one particular emulsion and creates a dye that stays in the emulsion. So uh, yeah, think of it as the colors being, being all added during the developing rather than in the making of the film uh, itself. Now the good thing, that's the bad news about Kodachrome in that they don't make it anymore. You can't get it developed in color anymore. Uh, there are a couple of bits of good news. And one of which, one is that the, I'm gonna show you some uh, footage here. The stuff that was shot, the stuff that was made and shot back in the 60s and even earlier than the 60s, the 50s and the 40s, it still looks really good. Let's have a look here. These are some, uh, this is some uh, footage from uh, about 19, early 1960s, 61 or so. That was uh, shot by my grandparents. This was in Mallorca. I mean, look at those colors. They're amazing. Look at those reds. Look at that car. <laughs> look at that hair in the gate. So this was shot ages ago and was, um, was not... Oh, I love these. This is some old Las Vegas footage. Yeah, this was shot shot ages ago and wasn't scanned until uh, a couple of months ago. And the colors look just as good as they ever did. Incredible. Um, I'll show, I've got some more now. This is some that was shot in 1996 by me in Morocco, of all places. Hopefully the sound, is, the music is, there's me. And that's my uh, Canon. We'll be seeing a bit of that later. The colors, still amazing, still brilliant. And the, uh, the lens on that camera is lovely as well. This is some uh, excellent footage. And that was shot 96. I mean, 96 seems a long time ago. Never mind 1961. And yeah, that's just, just beautiful. Now, like I said, can't get this anymore. Oh, little tip, uh, tip bit of information here. 
This is the last thing I shot on that Canon camera because the sand from the bloody Sahara Desert got into the camera while I was larking about. Look at that, and it killed the camera. That camera is kaput now, but it was almost worth it just to get this, uh, this great footage. So, what can you do with Kodachrome these days? Well, firstly, firstly, let's see how much it costs. Let's see, Kodachrome, 25 pounds for three, someone sold it for. Uh, 27 pounds for three, 15 for one, 15 one. So you're looking at about 10 pounds or uh, maybe, uh, maybe even less per cartridge. And when you consider that uh, black and white Tri-X is uh, coming in at something like 40 pounds, 45 pounds, there can still see a, a, a reason to shoot this stuff, even if it can nowadays only be developed in black and white. That is the, uh, the, the long and short of it. Even the professional labs these days can only do it in black and white. There was a rumor in 2017 that Kodak were gonna bring it back. Uh, that rumor turned out to be a lot, of, uh, a lot of BS. And believe me, I know about BS. My initials are BS. <laughs> so yes, so what do you wanna do if you wanna shoot some Kodachrome today? Well, you need a camera, obviously. You need a camera that can, that can shoot Kodachrome um, that has expired because it's all expired by now. It has all expired and it, um, it is not as sensitive as it used to be. In fact, you, uh, you need to give it a lot of light. Even when it was fresh, you needed to, uh, uh, you needed to give it a lot of light. It only went up to 40 ASA. So, um, you need a camera that can, um, that can uh, read the 40 ASA cartridge and then you want to ignore what it, what it tells you to expose it as and manually open up the iris a couple more stops. And here's the camera that I was shooting that Morocco footage on. We have here, some music on, the Canon Cano Sound. 514 XLS. A really good camera, this. And by the way, all the cameras I'm going to show you tonight are sound cameras. The reason why, well, you'll 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 see the reason why. <laughs> um, so yes, the Canon Cano Sound 514 XLS. Before I so do anything, I'm going to tell you a little secret about the naming uh, the naming scheme of these uh, Canon cameras. 514 XLS might seem like a, bit of, uh, a load of um, nonsensical numbers. No, they all mean something. Five means that it's a five times zoom. One four means that it can open the iris all the way up to 1.4, uh, F1.4. XL means it, uh, it can uh, shoot in existing light, which I'm gonna go uh, into that on, a, on another show. It's all about uh, shutter angles. And S means it's a sound camera. You've got your sound levels here. In fact, this was the first sound camera that Canon made, which is an interesting little factoid for you there. You switch it on by doing that, going, going to R, and here it goes. Oh. Always like to uh, play the sound of the cameras. And then RL here. You start filming, turn to RL, take your finger off, obviously it run lock. And finally, uh, is, there is, oops, now you turn it the other way. Turn it around the other way to, to one, it says there. And every time you pull the trigger, it's, uh, <laughs> okay, it's supposed to do one frame. Uh, some, something's not happening with the single frame here, I'm not sure. Never mind about that. Battery check, you press that, a red light comes on in the eyepiece. Over on the other side, you have your uh, 18 frames a second or 24 frames a second. You have your daylight filter there, and you have your film compartment opens up this way, which is nice. Now, here's where I was talking about the size of the cartridges. See, a, a sound camera cartridge, a sound cartridge fits nice into there. 
But this is the best thing about these sound machines. They also take the silent cartridges. So uh, if you have one of these, you can shoot either sound or silent. Now, let's uh, get close, up close and personal with this. What we've got here, let's, oh, not the zoom. What am I doing? Focus, yes. Okay. Right here is, that is your recording head and your sound recording assembly. So the film, what would happen is the film would come off there, through here, get exposed, and then round here, and uh, the sound would get recorded on it, which means that the uh, sound is always um, a few centimeters behind the picture on the film. Of course, the projectors that you use have exactly the same distance between the film gate and the sound head, so that when you play it back, what you hear is, uh, is going to come through at the same time. It's going to be all in sync with uh, what you're looking at. So the Canon 514 XLS, a damn good camera if you're thinking of uh, shooting sound or silent. In fact, they even made, a few years later, the autofocus version of it. So this is the Canon AF514 XLS. AF stands for autofocus. And here's the autofocus assembly here. I believe this was the first autofocus camera that Canon made. In fact, damn, I don't think, I can't think of any other Canon cameras that have autofocus. This might be the only one. Uh, unfortunately, this is the camera that got, um, that got uh, buggered in the desert and does not um, shoot anymore. In fact, I think the only thing that's still working is the autofocus. If I put batteries into this, which I'm not going to because um, I don't have the, the uh, holder at the end. I sold that. <laughs> just the just the battery holder but there you would see if I put my hands there you'd see the the focus uh, moving uh, around and about to uh, try and focus it wasn't the best of auto focuses uh, by today's standards but by super 8 camera standards it was a damn fine job damn fine camera ah uh, now what did I say earlier about needing to um, shoot this at a, uh, at a at a wide open aperture if you're going to shoot Kodachrome, the stuff is old. It's become a little bit, shall we say, insensitive over the years. You need to give it more light. And the only way to manually adjust this, um, this camera's uh, uh, aperture is through this thing called EE Lock. Now, I'm not going to demonstrate it live here because it's so bloody difficult to, uh, to, to, to show you the whole uh, thing. I'm going to show you a film that I made earlier. So yeah, please excuse the dust in the eyepiece. So what you have to do is to put, you have to put your hand or something in front of the lens until you see the, uh, you see the numbers going up and down. That's, those are your f-stops. So you've got to put your hand like in front of it until it gets to like 1.4 or whatever, 1.2, and then push up the E lock button, lever rather. But the lever won't stay in place which is really annoying. So you've got to put some tape or something to keep it up in place. So you've got to put your hand in front of it, get it onto one point, uh, F1.4 or F2 or some really wide open uh, setting, and then put the lever up to keep it in place, and then put the tape over the lever to keep the lever in place. An utterly ridiculous situation. I mean, I, I, the, only, the only reason I can imagine that the designers put this stupid e lock thing i mean even sankyo even sankyo managed to have a, a simple dial which could uh you know open and close your iris but with this e lock thing i've got a theory that they wanted to sell the more expensive uh 814 xls and the 1014 xls which have a proper uh exposure adjustment still it does work uh if you do the old uh, taping thing it works and um we are going to, uh, I'm going to show you some footage that I shot on this with sound, because that's what I've been doing this week. I went out and I shot with sound. But before any of that, you got to know, you got to find out whether your microphone's working, because these are old cameras. And they have old microphones. Before I show you, I'm going to show you this microphone here. This is the kind of microphone that you get with these things. 
Looks like a little plasticky piece of crap. It's actually not a bad microphone at all. Very often these uh, sound cameras have got this kind of, oops, this kind of uh, thing at the end, which is a mini jack and a little micro jack, which plug into here. But, you know, you don't want to go to all the trouble of getting a, a roll of uh, Super 8 and then shooting it and then uh, finding out that your mic doesn't work or the camera's heads don't work. So here's what I did to test out the cameras without actually using any film. Okay, I've, I've made a film on YouTube about this. You can, you can find it. This is just a, a fast version. What I did was I opened up one of these sound cartridges and I put some already shot film on it that has the sound stripe on it. Oh yeah, that's another thing. The sound is, uh, is carried on magnetic stripes on the side of the, uh, of the picture. And I then put the, camera back, the, the cartridge back together doesn't matter that it's uh, already been shot because, of course, I'm only uh, doing this for the sound stripe. So I then plugged the microphone into the camera and started recording, started filming, did a couple of test one, two, one, two. Uh, this camera also has an external microphone socket. So I tried one of these, uh, one of these nice boom microphones on it and uh, tried that one, two, one, two, whatever. And then I took the film out of the cartridge, put it on a spool, played it through a projector, and yay! I heard sounds, so I knew it was working. Brilliant. So, um, what I did was I then went out and filmed. Oops, we've seen that already. I went and filmed um, on the uh, north bank of the Thames this weekend. That's me. Uh, filming, you mustn't keep the you have, mustn't have the microphone too close to the camera. So uh, this microphone had a very long cable, and as you see here, I put the cable. There we go. All the way, I hung the microphone on that on that bar there. And before I developed the film, I uh, I took a foot or so out and I made test strips because I wanted to see how long it should be in the developer. So I put some test strips into this little Patterson tank. And there we have three minutes, six minutes, nine minutes, and 12 minutes in the, in the uh, developer. And that's it being scanned by my Wolverine. And there it goes into the Wolverine. And the results of that test, three minutes, no good. Six minutes, a bit better. Uh, nine minutes, not bad. 12 minutes, very good. Maybe slightly over, maybe slightly too much. The point is, is that once you've done this and you've still got all your developing kit out, you can just quickly see exactly what the, uh, the right amount of time is in the, uh, in the developer, which is very, very, very useful information. I urge everyone to do as many um, test strips as you can, because you, otherwise you're working blind. Here's the developer I use, something called Caffeinol CH, which is uh, coffee, washing soda, vitamin C powder, and a gram of potassium bromide. That's very important, the potassium bromide. And uh, one liter of water. You can, uh, that's my Lomo tank. Uh, it would say, uh, yeah, rinse then, fix for five minutes. This is all good info. Look at this, I love this. That's the, that's the magnetic strip stripe on the side of it. It looks so great. Anyway, <laughs> um, that's me after I'd uh, fixed it. That's the, uh, there's the fixer coming out there. And then, of course, um, final rinse with uh, soft water and photo flow. London has very hard water, so uh, this uh, just sort of uh, gives it a final, a final rinse to uh, get. Uh, you can use a drop of washing up liquid instead of photo flow. I got that photo flow years ago, and it's still you only use one drop at a time. Anyway, so that's me uh, rinsing it up. And finally, uh, well, I mean, shall we see the results of that? Why not? Um, oh, but beforehand, um, what about the uh, the sound? I've I developed the uh, the, the picture in um, in Caffinol, but how am I going to get the sound? Well, I put the film through a sound projector, and I made a a cable that goes from the external speaker of the projector. Uh, goes through some resistors to uh, to to make sh to to change the uh, the level of the thing and then into level of the sound, and then into a into the computer where I just captured it, and then of course I put the sound 
and the picture together. Uh, because I was doing it as a negative, what I did was I uh, reversed the negative in uh, Premiere and uh, tinted it a little bit because it was, uh, I don't know, it was looking a little bit uh, grey. So uh, I tinted it slightly because I like to tint these things a little bit. And finally, with the sound and the image, here is my Kodachrome day out on Tower Bridge. Let's do one, two, one, two of the uh, Kodachrome 40 in the Canon. We're at uh, about f2.4 here. That's the noise you've got to put up with uh, on the underground if you live in North London, by the way. Hello, I'm Lily. I'm Sissy, Lily's mum. And London's just gone into tier two lockdown. Yay, we're on Tower Bridge, um, we're meeting outside, I'm drinking Costa, a peppermint tea from Costa. Um, it's quite a nice day, pretty mild. It's not raining at least. It's not raining. Um, the river looks cold. It is uh, still vibrant, you can't crush the spirit of the city, even though we might all be uh, dead in about um, a month or two. <laughs> ah, Torquilla, the Tower of London. There we go. And uh, all the other towers behind it. down then to the Thames, down the north bank. It's moving. Yeah. We're, we're no, the London Eye. Oh. I think it must be going working. Uh, no, I don't think it is. Good. It is, it is. I've just watched a pod move oh, forward. F8, F4, F1.4, F2.8, F3.5. F4, box speed F5.6, F8, don't be late. And there you have it. Some, uh, some, uh, oop, where have I gone? Where am I? Oh, here I am. <laughs> In fact, let's go back to the, uh, the main room. So, yeah, that is, uh, that is, was um, Kodachrome sound film developed as a negative and then uh, resynchronized using a Canon 814, uh, uh, 514 XLS. In fact, let's see how much one of those are gonna cost you these days, because uh, they've been going up in price. One was sold here for 94 pounds 89, that's not a bad deal. 165, 175, uh, oh, 19.99, don't get that, that sounds like it's buggered. 28, again, ooh, uh, too good to be true there, 69. So the prices are all over the place. Um, the problem is these uh, these sound, these Canon um, uh, uh, 514s, they can be a bit pricey and they also have plastic gears in them, which can uh, die over the years. And once they're gone, the camera is uh, pretty much bricked. So what, are some cheaper sound camera alternatives, I hear you all ask. Well, I'm gonna show you what else I got. The Umig, oh, let's have some music. The, the Umig Sound 31 XL. Rubbish music. <laughs> the Umig Sound 31 XL. A, uh, a very nice, unfocused, there we go. 
Uh, a nice film, a nice film camera, Super 8 camera, made by Bell and Howell. But like I said in the uh, Filmo Sonic um, last the other week, it's actually better quality than the uh, the Bell and Howell. So for some reason, Bell and Howell made made cameras that were uh, better than their own cameras for Umig. Um, they're very big and boxy. These sound cameras. It has. Let's see. Just run down a few. Uh, a few uh, features of it. Uh, motorized zoom. Let's see if uh, that works. Well, firstly, let's switch it on. Very healthy sound there. Um, motorized zoom. Yeah, as usual, the motorized zoom is is uh, broken. Uh, plus correct. That's your. That's where it opens it up one stop. If you've got a. Um, uh, backlit subject, it's battery test here. Yep, it's working. Footage counter down here are the are the camera um, features. Now, if you're going to get one of these, make sure that it has uh, headphones with it because they they didn't put they didn't put normal mini jack uh, uh, socket in for the headphones. They put this this rather nasty proprietary weird earpiece thing. I got this, it had an earpiece, and I uh, butchered the earpiece, and I actually turned it uh, into a mini jack um, wire. So uh, yeah, watch out for that. You won't be able to monitor your sound, which is, a, which is not good, because you, you really do want to hear what you're, uh, what you're filming. Um, external, external mic there, if you're mic. That thing, not altogether sure, it might be an external power. I don't know. Anyway, on the other, look at that, I'm stumped. <laughs> um, on here, the all important manual or automatic iris. And here's your, uh, you know, your uh, um, sun filter. Uh, this thing up here, again, not altogether sure. Oh, that's a fade. That's a fade. It can actually, if you press that while filming, it'll fade out and you can fade back in. Not much point, really. And inside, oh, there's a Katsuyama in there. <laughs> Reds under the beds. What's that doing there? Um, yeah, it can only automatically meter. Um, well, these days it would be um, 50 and 200 ASA, though it's actually 40 and 160 ASA. Um, but if you're going to be shooting Kodachrome, then you're going to be uh, ignoring that and uh, opening it up pretty wide. So that's the Numix Sound 31 XL. It has a uh, big brother which is this very similar but better the umig macro sound 65 xl uh very nice camera has all all the things that the uh, the first one i showed you has but it's also got single frame shooting yeah and you can uh, you can remote control it as well. Here's an interesting fact: if you don't shoot um, sound, but you have one of these cameras that comes with a mic anyway, this and these things are heavy. This uh, double plug here, which plugs in the small one, which AKA micro jack, goes into there, and the small one can actually be used to trigger the camera, uh, there we go, with the switch on the microphone. The microphone switch is also a remote operation switch. So if I just do this, every time I switch that, that's one frame. Or of course, you can uh, go to a remote location and trigger it remotely. And you don't even need sound film to do this. You just use the microphone as a remote trigger, which is very useful. It uh, the sounds the uh, the Umig Sound Macro Sound 65. Obviously, it's got macro. It's got a massive lens. Look at the size of that lens. That's bigger than the Canon. Look, there's the Canon on the right, and there's the uh, the the Umig on the left. You can shoot in some seriously low light with this thing. You can go down to 1.2. F1.2, which is practically night vision. Um, this thing cost me 20 pounds at a, uh, a, ch a charity sale. 
And uh, what's inside it? Oh, there's, a, there's something inside it. Oh, it's an old ectochrome. So, so you see, a silent cartridge will work in this. It just uh, doesn't, doesn't go through the, the sound head. And it's got your uh, manual uh, iris there. And altogether, a very nice camera. A, uh, good features. It's uh, compatible with today's films. And uh, it's got that macro build, that, that UMIG build quality as well. Believe it or not, I've never had a UMIG break on me. Every UMIG camera I've ever bought is still working, which is more than I can say for uh, some other cameras, let me tell you. Now, how much are these going to set you back if you get one of these? They're not that expensive. Let's have a look. The, uh, uh, the uh, well, let's get this off first. Let's get these out of the way. Bing, off they go. Um, look at this, one, oh, spares or repair. <laughs> so much for the uh, UMIG reliability. Here's one, went for uh, 35 pounds, untested. Okay, that might also be uh, be buggered. Never know, it's, uh, you know, let's see uh, ones that have been sold. No, same, oh. No, a bunch of, you see, the problem is the camera, the camera's called XL, so a bunch of uh, jackets come up, a bunch of uh, clothes for the obese or gangly gentleman come up. Uh, let's have a look at the other, at the other UMIG. Here's the 31 XL, 56.99, that's a little bit steep, I think. Seven pounds 50, there we go, someone bought one for seven pounds 50. It says fab condition. read description, uh-oh. When, <laughs> when an eBay sale says read description, it's usually bad news. But uh, here's a 23XL, and some, then of course more clothes for the uh, for you know chubby children and stuff. But uh, yeah, I mean these are looking these are these uh, Umix are pretty much half the price of the Canons, and uh, it's a good deal if you're going to get a uh, um, a sound camera if you want to shoot a bit of sound. In fact, let's have some footage. Let's have a look at some footage that I shot in sound. What have we got first? Let's do one, two, one, two. Um, here we go. Okay, here are some sound tests. Now, I apologize in advance for the ropey quality of this. I was not, um, uh, I was, I was a, it was early on in my developing, uh, de <laughs> my own personal development, developing development. Uh, so you, yes, you, you, uh, we'll go into that later. I, I um, uh, this is I think the first one of the first times I tried to sh to uh, developed um, sound suit sound Kodachrome as a reversal. So let's have a look at the sound test. This is from the UMIG thirty one. Testing my Super A camera, my UMIG, and uh, with the handheld microphone. It's a lovely morning in London. And cut. And now testing out the Bell & Howell Filmasonic 1223 with the handheld microphone. Hi that bloody building site. Okay, cut. Sound 21. 31. 31. Okay. I've had. Alright. So, uh, what were you saying about the office? I was saying how. Alright, and now let's have a bit of uh, footage from the Umix Sound 65. Uh, this doesn't have sound, this bit. This was a reversal development of Kodachrome. It looks all yellow, as did some of that previous footage. There's a very good reason for that. Um, I'll go into it later, maybe. But it's possible to, for it to look normal grey, black and white, or this kind of like sepia yellow, which is very nice. Now, is there any sound on this one? This was shot, I think, at 1.2, f1.2. <laughs> No, there's no sound on that. Never mind. That's just to show you that the UMIG is a uh, a damn fine camera. That's uh... so. That was the UMIG, and finally we've got another camera here. 
Let's get eBay off there. I've found out that whenever I put the eBay up for some reason, it um, slows down my frame rate. It goes all the way down to like six FPS. In fact, now it's only at seven FPS. I should get a, a, a better, um, better processor or graphics card on this computer. Never mind. Oh, here's the, here's another one. Got some music, why not? The Yashica Sound 50 XL Macro with this handle underneath. And you think, well, what's the point of putting your hand in that and trying to film with a handle underneath? What do they think they are, a bolia? No, this handle can be swiveled for left-handed or for right-handed people. And when it's on this side, I'm going to put the main camera on. It looks, here we go. It looks an awful lot like a camcorder, like a like a chunky 80s camcorder. This, All these cameras were made in the late 70s, by the way, uh, apart from the uh, Canon autofocus, which was like 82, 83, from 80 to 83. But you're supposed to, I mean, if you go around, if you see someone in the street doing this, you're going to think, oh, he's got one of those old chunky video cameras. No, it's a Super 8 camera. And I found out these are quite rare for some reason. It's, does it work? Yay. It works. Let's get the music down a bit. I don't know if I'm drowning myself out. I'm, uh, I've got very poor audio uh, monitoring facilities here. Now, I won't get the, the batteries out, but they are inside this handle. Oh God, what a mess on the screen. Let's get me off for a start. There we go. Yeah, it looks really high spec, but it's a bit of a turd, this camera, I've got to say. Okay, it's firstly, it takes two uh, types of batteries. The sound setup actually takes a, a square nine volt battery in the back there. So if you ever see one of these on sale and they say, oh, I, uh, the sound doesn't work, it could be they don't even know that it needs an extra battery. Um, it's got, can't shut the thing now, because the, it, the eye cup is in the way. There it goes. Uh, it's got this very fancy, but ultimately not particularly uh, useful footage counter here. If you can turn around. It's got your wide angle and tele buttons. Now, I'm sure they work. Did I not switch this thing on? There we go. Look at this. It actually does work. The motorized zoom on this Yashica does work. <laughs> go figure. Uh, four, two, one times half. I'm not altogether sure what those are. That, that might be some kind of exposure compensation. I doubt it's the, the um, shutter size. Nothing actually seems to happen when I do that. I'll, I'll look that one up. And then there's the, uh, the filter. The, um, the sun filter, a pretty decent lens, it has to be said, pretty big lens. Unfortunately, there's a there's a mold spot in there. Fungus there, see that? Fungus, fungus the bogeyman right there. Uh, luckily, it doesn't seem to to uh, come up on the picture when you uh, when you when you film. It's got macro 1.2 f 1.2. Uh, you can uh, power it with external external power there. Um, you can at least plug a normal pair of headphones into the damn thing. That's your monitor there. And there's your usual, uh, your double um, socket for the microphone. And on the other side, bugger all, <laughs> just, just the uh, thing that opens the, uh, opens, there we go. And it's got the normal kind of film compartment in there. So let's have a look at some footage shot with the Yashica Sound 50 XL. And it's the, uh, it's the demo again, the demo from last time. And as you will see, there are issues with this camera in that the sound only kicks in like a second after you start filming. Now, um, 
I asked Bill Rogers about that, and he said it could be uh, just a lubrication thing that the sound's head isn't isn't clocking on uh, fast enough. But it does work, and I guess if you know that the uh, it's got that whole issue with the sound, well, let's just see, and I'll I'll show you. There we go. Students making a right old bleeding racket there. Uh, I'm sure it's for a good cause. So I know what you're thinking. <laughs> I've said that before, but I really don't know what you're thinking. Actually, I could read. I could read the YouTube comments if I know to see what you're thinking. But if every time you film, you develop this stuff, and you uh, uh, digitize it, if you have to then uh, put the sound, record the sound separately, and uh, put it onto the uh, film in uh, in Premiere or editing program, then what is the point, right? I mean, why don't you just film with, with uh, fresh film, with mute film, with silent film, and then record separately, like on an on a audio recorder? Well, yep, I, that's been done. I've done that. Here's a, here's a very small bit of uh, footage from that. So, um, Embankment by Houses of Parliament. Yeah, I'll... Um... Here we are at the Houses of Parliament on London's Embankment, filming on Super 8 with recorded sound. Hi there, and welcome to filmmaking Super 8. Oh God. <laughs> welcome to filmmaking in um, extreme darkness and low light. I push it to the max two hours. <laughs> so. What is the, uh, so that was, oh, by the way, that was on Triex and the second was on uh, Fomapan. So if you shoot sound and you can't uh, play it straight, uh, straight onto the, um, uh, you, can't, you can't, you're not projecting it from a, a projector, a Super 8 projector, a sound Super 8 projector, then of course, what is the point? Because you can, um, you're just using the sound stripe to uh, separately record sound. You might as well do it on a sound recorder like I just showed you there. Well, it all ties in with negative versus reversal footage. Now negative, you know what that is, right? I mean, I don't have to explain what, what negatives are. Reversal is what they call basically positive. Uh, see this Kodak Ektachrome here, you see, when that was sound color film, which when you pro uh, projected it, it was a positive image. So, <clears throat> it's a complicated thing to develop reversal. It really is. It's, it's, it involves more steps. The negative was basically just the developer and the, um, the developer and, uh, and the fixer. But the, uh, to do reversal, requires all this extra chemicals, it requires extra steps, it requires a, uh, a, a bleaching stage, and it requires two developments, first developer and second developer. And um, it's a big pain in the bum, but of course then you end up with a film that you can watch and project straight from Super 8, uh, from, a, from a Super 8 uh, projector. Here's some standard eight, having said that, that I developed uh, reversal. This is the first Kodachrome standard eight that I developed as reversal. Gives it this uh, lovely LucasAid color if you use the first developer 
again as the second developer, uh, which I just did out of sheer laziness. But I came up with this kind of uh, violent orange tint, which I don't know, it looks nice if that's the effect you're going for. However, all my ropey development is um, this is this is not too bad. Oh, there's Dotty the chicken. Ah, oh, taken from us too soon, poor Dotty. I won't even tell you how she died. It wasn't nice. But uh, there's um, there's people out there who can do this reversal developing a hell of a lot better than me. In fact, that's a nice way to. Whoops, not not that. <laughs> there, there's a nice way to uh, get into our um, our guest of for today, who um, I am going to show you something that he developed, which is light years ahead of, uh, in terms of quality. This is a, this is a uh, Kodachrome reversal developed by none other than my guest tonight. And my guest is a pioneer in the film, in the field of developing reverse, uh, expired film. He is, you could call him a chemist, you could call him an alchemist, some people call him a wizard. Um, he, uh, he directs music videos on expired film, which uh, gives them a hear you then, look. Then. And um, he's a veteran of Super 8 and 16mm. He is very generous with his uh, sharing his processes. In fact, <coughs> I wouldn't have got half as far as I, as I have if he hadn't been so generous about uh, telling all and sundry about how he does it. And uh, in doing that, he has uh, kickstarted many people's home developing. And uh, you could call him an architect of the worldwide resurgence of Super 8. And more than any of that, his films look amazing. He is, of course, Adrian Cousins. Adrian. Adrian? Ah, yes, I can hear you. Now. Ah, yes, here we are. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Um, Adrian, when did you start shooting on film? Um, I started in the early 90s when I was at college, and then um, I, I was doing animation, so they said uh, the best thing you could do is go out and get yourself a Super 8 camera and some film and mess about with uh, single frame footage, um, shooting. So I, I did that, but got bored pretty quickly and started shooting live action. And then I stopped about 94, uh, more or less, because uh, that's basically when, you know, sort of um, non-linear editing and digital video started. Mm. Um, and then I didn't start again until 2000 and, uh, 2014, 15, uh, when I got ill with uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. So I just took up, uh, I couldn't work. So I uh, started filming again, you know, to sort of stop me from going mad. Yeah, my, my own timeline follows uh, very similarly to yours. I think we're of the similar generation where when, when we came up, film was all we had. And then, of course, video came along and uh, we all did video for a bit and then we rediscovered film as well. But um, I've got to say, you, you're an inspiration for me in the field of expired film because, you know, we don't all have unlimited money to spend on, uh, on fresh Super 8 stock. And expired film, as we've seen, is a hell of a lot cheaper. But, but can I ask you why you started with expired film? Was it the cost or was it the challenge? Um, well, initially I intended to use, I wanted to develop my own film. Um, so I wanted to, 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 to basically control the process, if you like, from the beginning of shooting the footage right to the, to the point where you develop and make your own, um, images. So, um, so to, to learn how to do that, I, I thought I'd start with cheap film before moving on to the more, to new stock. So I started, you know, Kodachrome's probably one of the easiest Super 8 films to get hold of, and it's quite cheap. 
Um, so I start in many ways. That was my introduction to um, to film. So to developing film. Mm. So uh, yeah. So it wasn't it wasn't really about saving money. There was always a sort of intention to to move on to developing um, new film, new stock. But actually there's a quality to, to expired film that you can't, and developing it yourself, that you can't get with mm. new stock, um, which as I developed more and more different kinds of films, I grew to realise that there's something um, quite pleasant about mm. um, using expired film. And it was more practical to develop it yourself. It's not really, I don't think it's really, it's not a great way of saving money, you know, because you, if you buy a, I don't know, you buy a roll of um, that Edgecrone 160A and you want to send it to get processed, you know, the most likely place to send it is, um, well, first of all, you might think you send it to Gage. Gage won't do it because it's got Remjet batting, backing on it. And it's, you know, it, it's just a world of trouble for them. So quite rightly, they don't do it. Mm. But there's a guy in um, in the Netherlands called uh, Frank Bruinsma that runs a Super 8 reversal lab. You know, you're looking at 48, 50 quid um, for one of those carts, you know. So it's not actually a great way of saving money. Um, uh, unless, of course, you're processing it yourself. Right. Um, so that's, that's how that sort of evolved, really. Yeah. No, I've got to say, um, expired film does go kind of hand in hand with with home processing. Mm -hmm. um, and the Remjet you mentioned, for those who don't know, that um, some films, um, Kodak negative films and Kodachrome, have this kind of black, dirty kind of stuff which is on the back of the film, which uh, is an anti-halation layer. Go look it up. I can't explain it. And... Um, and you've got to wash it off and every time you develop anything and it, and it gets everywhere and it's a disgusting mucky job. Um, but, uh, you've, you've obviously developed a great deal of other, other, um, uh, expired film, which doesn't have Remjet. Not all of it has. Um, in fact, what's the, uh, what's the most recent, uh, expired film that you've developed? Um, well, today I've developed some, um, 16 mil, um, Ilford from 1972 for somebody, and I didn't shoot it, but uh, uh, somebody bought some and uh, looked online to see uh, what sort of results he could expect from uh, Ilford FP4 and he found a film that I'd made and so he, he went on Facebook and said, does anybody know how I can get these sorts of results? Mm -hmm. So I said, I do, because uh, I do. And uh, and then that sort of snowballed into me actually helping him to, to, to develop the film. So that's what I've done today. But for the last two months, three months, I've just been doing act, um, Kodachrome. Ah. Uh, in fact, that's what I'm doing now for the foreseeable future is, is processing Kodachrome in colour, trying to process well, Kodachrome in colour. Having um, said that, let's, uh, let's have a look at some of the results that you've, uh, that you've come up with. Um, Here's some still images that you've uh, you've shared, and these are Kodachrome. These are these are stills from 16 mil Kodachrome. Am I right? That's right. Yes, and, and you you've know, got colours. They have got colours. I mean, there's a bit of a disclaimer here that you know, and this is true of expired stock generally is that the objective is to get it to a place through processing where you can um, you you can scan it and get a working image from it digitally because mm. the workflow is all digital. It is from film to digital and distributed digitally like we're doing now. Right. And so there's a lot, there's a lot of messing with the curves in Photoshop to get this. Right. Um, but nevertheless, uh, it's out of place as stills. These are all stills. I'm developing these as stills at the moment, although I have done moving image. Yeah, we have, we have some, uh, some of your moving image. Let me, uh, I'll just bring you into the, into the screening room here. We've got, um, let's see, got this for a start, which was, uh, I think an early, um, I'm sorry about the yeah. choppiness of the images. It's just my yeah. computer having a spaz. Um, but if I pause yeah, that. Yeah, about two years ago. Yeah. yeah. I can, I can date 
your progress by uh, the age of your son. Your uh... <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. here's a more recent one, which is nothing short of uh, terrifying. <laughs> yeah. What what did you? How did you get this? Well, um, the, this one was um, I I used. There's a there's a kit you can buy called uh, Polytoner, produced by a company called Rockland in the states, and they um, first call sell it in this country, and it's a, you get some little some little um, containers, three colours, um, blue. It's supposed to be cyan, but it's blue, um, yellow, and magenta. Um, and this is done using those those um, couplers as substitute couplers because we haven't got the Kodak uh, mm. couplers. And I mean, this this video in, uh, illustrates quite a lot of the problems of, of developing Kodak Chrome, and that is that if you overexpose um, when you're doing the red, the red is basically um, creates uh, the cyan color so it's negative so it's, it's the opposite so you get this, this, the cyan color from the red if you overexpose the, that's that red exposure it basically exposes all the or, or practically all the um the halides in the side in the side in the whole of the film so you just get a film that is largely one color this one is two colors actually i think it's 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 cyan and magenta so you've got a sort of purpley bluey sort of um, uh, uh, colour, yeah. and then the there is yellow in there, as you can see. I did do a yellow stage, but it was completely obliterated by the the heavy sign. What and what the, caused that? Um, is that solarisation going on? This there? area around his his, his mouth, uh, and that's this is interesting. This bit here, this is where the rem jet didn't come off. So when I exposed it through the base. It didn't. It didn't. Uh, it didn't make the sign developable. And that that little section of the film had a bit of remjet left on it. Oh, this, so, this is where it's all orange. Yeah. So uh, the cyan didn't work. So there's no cyan in that image. So what it meant is that when I came to expose the next stage, which was which was blue light, which produces a yellow. Uh, image and then magenta, you do a white light uh, and you, you do the magenta image it actually gave us just those two colors yellow and magenta which is why you've got this ready orange color <clears throat> wow and um, sorry that that disruption around the mouth was is caused by incorrectly um i think it's i, well, I don't know the explanation for it i think it's possibly due to overexposure um but it could also be for, to, down to um developer that hasn't properly uh, the coupler that hasn't properly distributed itself or dispersed through the um the emulsion so you get these clumps it looks amazing i mean i've I, it's 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 proof of the uh, the old adage that there are no bad developments i mean that every even when film goes wrong it looks good well you know this uh, What's, what's interesting is, I mean, I, I, you know, the more I've gone into this, um, the more you, you actually see um, what the potential is for Kodachrome today. And in terms of reproducing what we know as Kodachrome, the sort of images that you showed where you took in Morocco, you know, that's gone. Yeah, you know, that was my next question, which is that will we ever will we ever see that again? No. Well, you do. The thing is, the ectochrome was designed to be the super, the, the film that superseded Kodachrome, and we now have the best color reversal film I think that we've ever had. You know, <clears throat> uh, in terms of practicality, um, the new ectochrome is is far. You know, it's hundred ASA. You know, ectochrome if you're shooting it. Um, Kodachrome, if you're shooting it outside, it's 25 ASA. So we've got 100 yeah. ASA uh, color reversal film. The color's fantastic. Um, you can get it processed really cheaply. You can process it yourself really cheaply and really easy in E6. E6 is a wonderful <laughs> process, and you really appreciate it when you try and develop Kodachrome, which mm. is a different process, and, and understand how complex and how difficult it is to get color, the right color balance and so on. So... <clears throat> If you want to get if you want to get that Kodachrome look, go get some Ectochrome and mess about with the grading. It's, right. it's the quickest way to do it. It's a far better way of doing it. And mm. also, the closest you're going to get to a projectable uh, a projectable Kodachrome 
is to get ectochrome because right. um, and I was I was looking for the I mean if you think about it if you could magically empty out all the color couplers from uh, Fuji or ectochrome 100D right magically take all the color dyes out and replace them with some um, you know cheap couplers that you got from some guy down the back of Deptford High Street or something. Um, or Dwayne. Uh, yeah. What, <laughs> but if you could, you know, somehow replace the color, the colors in Ectochrome or Fuji or whatever with some other colors, I, would you be justified in calling that film Ectochrome 100D? Because you've changed the way that the, the color couplers work. Yeah. And that's the truth. The truth about Kodachrome is unless you're using the specified uh, couplers that are in the Kodachrome patent uh, and in the manufacturer's safety data sheets, you're not you're not developing Kodachrome. You're not going to get the greens of summer, mm. you know, as the song says, because you ain't you ain't got the you haven't got the cyan that was used in in Kodachrome. So right. reproducing that Kodachrome look is it, um, quickest way is Ectochrome. What you get with Kodachrome is something completely different to the old Kodachrome. Yeah. Well, I have, a couple of, um, I have a couple of pictures here by a guy called uh, Kerry, Kerry yeah. Shane Fuller, yeah. who has uh, made some progress with developing old Kodachrome using um, uh, 35 mil still, still, stock, still photo stock. And it's, you know, you, you can see he's made, he's, he has brought out colors, but they're kind of muted and there's it's mm -hmm. not it's not like the classic um kodachrome um yeah. but it is i mean i think what we're saying here is that it's 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 good for messing about with but um it's it's not it's it, we're not we're not going to bring it back when it's it's uh it's <coughs> it's pretty much a, a historical format yeah i know but you know i think there's a there is a justification you have to have a justification to to spend four and a half hours making the developers and then you know an hour uh d doing a, a small clip like that to get the exposure right um and it, the the justification is not trying to recreate the kodachrome that was killed in 2010 the what you're doing is using the opportunities afforded to you by a Tri pack black and white color film that is sensitive to the red, green, and blue light separately to use the possibilities that that presents to you to do to make images with a texture uh, and a quality, a sort of quality that you're not going to get. Mm. You're not going to get um, using ectochrome, right? And also, I would say that if you if you look at some of the some of the popular films. The, at the moment, things that people, films that people really would like to get their hands on, um, Lomo Chrome Purple, Aerochrome, um, they, those films are false colour films. And, you know, so Kodachrome can be a false colour, false colour film, you know, so, but you actually add the colours yourself. So you mm. can get something very, and it's a very lovely stock, you know, it's mm. it, as a black and white, it's actually a very, if you get it right, it's yeah, a yeah. really, really nice stock. Yeah. So there's a lot to be said for using it still, mm. um, both in black and white, as negative reversal, or as trying to mess around with, with the, the possibilities that, you know, colour development gives you. Yeah. A uh, question's come in uh, on the uh, YouTube chat. Has Ooh. Adrian ever tried pre-striping any of the new film stocks? No. No. Okay, short answer. <laughs> but it's—I mean, I do know that you've been. Wait, um, was it a boy in Italy, in Italy that does it though? I think. Yeah, uh, they, they, they they kind of paint the magnetic strip on, don't they? That's it. Yes, some sort of slurry or something. Yeah, I mean that's really for the people who. I think sound super eight generally uh, goes hand to hand with with reversal developing because it's really comes into its own once you put it through an actual projector. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you like, I showed before, if you're going to just get it all digitized and then capture the sound and then sync them up, you might as well use a proper sound recorder and mm -hmm. better film stock. 
Um, though that said, I understand that you've uh, recently purchased a piece of uh, Kodachrome history in the form of a 200-foot cartridge, which is uh, yeah. four times the uh, <laughs> the length of uh, of one of these. One of these. Holy moly! Yeah, I haven't. <laughs> so, done I haven't taken it out of the box yet. Shall I take it out of the box? Oh, if you could do an uh, unboxing for us, that would be great. If you were going to do it anyway. I couldn't do particularly well now, done professional unboxing. It's me taking it out of the box. I hate First unboxing I videos where they don't just get to the point. Oh, look, that's... Oh. So, so one of those could go for like 13 minutes or something? 13, 14 minutes of footage? I, I haven't even looked, to be honest right. with you. I'm, sure. I'm just going on... Um, just three minutes button twenty button times button four. Button yeah, sort of. <laughs> but these, uh, these were practical, I think. In some yeah, way. these were, were these sold as um, one-time use things that you would then send the entire thing back to the lab. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, I mean, there's not a lot of them floating about. So um, I saw one on eBay recently. It was only twenty pounds. Yes, yeah. uh, but I mean. Yeah. It, the, we really, I mean, if Super 8 is going to go the 16 mil route and have proper magazines that can be loaded, it's only really going to work if you can also buy 200 foot spools of, uh, you know, fresh negative and, and have a have a magazine that's been designed to be reloaded. Um, yeah. Unlike, unlike the, uh, the ones that you've... Uh... And of course, it's only practical if you... If you it's only, it only makes sense... If you can process 200 foot at one go, um, which Lomo tanks can't, you know, you don't even wait. the only way you, you do that is through a continuous processor, which as we've just spent the last 20 minutes discussing is unlikely to happen. So it, I, I mean, I bought this because this it is great and I want to get to grips with it and have a look at it. And then I'm obviously going to have to buy a Dremel or something and cut it open and look at yeah, it. Like, yeah. But I don't well, know how practical it is. Really. While we're on the subject of sound film, mm -hmm. and uh, someone's asked about this, they say they have some of this Agfa yeah. movie chrome sound. And, uh, it's not even movie chrome. It's, 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 it's Agfa chrome. Yes, it's even older than movie chrome. Yeah. Agfa chrome. It's a lovely Harlequin style box. Um, but, I mean, someone's written any thoughts. I mean, it's this is this is a you can do this in E six, can't you? Um, you can. You'd have to do it low temp. Um, I think you might probably have. I don't know. There's people that do more. I haven't. I've not. Hmm. As, I haven't really gone to town on the adverts yet. But uh, I think you'd be better off with an older Orwo. Hmm. Um, now I'm on six five. Is a process which uses CD right. CD one. So I think it might be that. Um, I might be wrong. I'm sure people will uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it's, I'd say it's worth giving it a go. You know, the thing about expired film is, is a philo philosophical point about it, and that is you have to be, despite it, it is precious, you know, you are, but you have to be unprecious about it. You have to be prepared for the things that you film to not come out. You know, um, so, so, and you have to film with that in mind. So, you know, if it's not for bar bitzers or weddings or, you know, where you, if, oh, well, you can do, but I'd say use some new footage, new stock as well. So you can combine the two. So you've got, uh, you know, you've got something that you can rely on. But that said, you know, um, common with the adverts, you might get this lovely, bombastic blue color mm. uh blue toned uh, images out of it which have got this wonderful quality to them that you you know you wouldn't necessarily want your film to come out like that but when it does it you have to find the positives about it and that you know you do get some lovely colors from from failure yeah i'm personally um I'd, i i don't have an e6 chemistry knocking about but i do have some ecn too mm -hmm. And I just, every every expired color film I shoot, I just throw some of it into the ECN too, because it, it okay, the color shifts are insane, but it always comes up with something. 
yeah, and, uh, yeah. So, you, yeah uh, on the whole is a lot safer than doing reversal you will you know um you can make you can do reversal processing and get absolutely nothing at the end of it oh um, i've been there i've look, been there with kodachrome 2 horrible yes, stuff I I, yes. yeah, just above me there kodachrome 2 i would i mean i was my advice to anyone is uh don't don't bother with kodachrome 2 i mean obviously you've managed to get results because because you're the wizard but uh, <laughs> it's it's it is pretty horrible stuff um finally what advice would you give someone wanting to start shooting and developing their own film um just go ahead get yourself a low mo tank if you can afford to get a new one um from russia or the ukraine get a new one um you can get a second hand one but you know i just think well i got a second hand one first and um i found that when i got a new one it was much easier to load a new one because it's got less little scratches and nicks and you know unlikely to have warping on any of those, yeah. any of those things so yeah get a low mo. if you can't get a low mo you can get a bucket you yeah. know um there's a design online um i'm film calling for a um a tank basically made out of a bit of uh tubing um plumbing tubing with some strips of uh what it is to, to keep the film on um that, that's a very good idea. So, you know, you, or you can get one of the big Patterson tanks and stuff it in there. Yeah, I've done that. That's yeah. how I started. Did it spaghetti style. You know, and it, 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 uh, things like Remjet can can be, a, they are a pain in the ass, but also they can be part of, of, of the look that you get at the end, which you're not going to get buying, uh, um, buying some vision film and shooting it and sending it away. You're just not going to get that. There's no way to do to get these, these, um, uh, this sort of footage uh, without in, it, doing it yourself. And then the, obviously the footage um, bears your mark, if you like. Mm. So you know, it's like thumbprints on, on, on um, bricks or whatever, you know, that you, you are part of your labor, if you like, your work it becomes part of the end result. So, I definitely get into Super 8 um, yeah. or, or film, you know, 16 mils. You know. Yeah, or Standard 8. Um, or fact, Standard 8, yeah. There's a, there's a guy, he asks this every week, um, but he's obsessed with the um, Tanner Martin asks, have either of you dealt with pre-striped Standard 8 film for the Fairchild sound camera? No, I've got a roll of it, I think. Uh, I've got a roll of that um, K2 yeah. Pretty striped, sitting in my fridge. Uh, somebody gave me, but I'll never. Yeah, you'd need to get one of those Fairchild cameras, wouldn't you? K two, yeah, K two is a difficult one. Uh, it, it, it really does depend on how well it's been stored, and by that I mean that doesn't mean it has to have been in the fridge. I the, the one that I did that I did, did as reversal. Um, my friend uh, uh, just been to a, a flea market in France and bought. Uh, a double eight camera and it had got this roll in it and so it, it probably just been sat in that camera um for years well since 1968 69 when it was filmed and you know i think the cameras that do it's a bit of a protective protective environment for them because it's it's light safe so it's probably a bit airtight and you know the, mm -hmm. the temperature is regulating it keeps cool and so on so if you get a bit of luck and you get a decently stored um bit of Kodakam uh, 3, you can get away with it, you know. I've got to say, that's that's the only time I try my hand at Kodachrome 2 is when there's been a, a, a shot cartridge in a camera that I've acquired. And um, I feel that I kind of owe it to the people, the previous owner of the camera who shot mm -hmm. half a roll or a roll and they just never got it processed. You never know what's on those. And it's mm -hmm. it's often fascinating to to see these sometimes probably long dead people finally mm. um their images finally coming out mm. on the uh on the on the uh on the old film um but uh um before i let you go do you have a uh a website or a uh a, a place where we can see more of your uh footage um, I don't have a website. I'm on YouTube. Um, so I've got a YouTube channel, which pretty much everything um, goes on there. 
Um, so that's just AD Cousins, like youtube.com forward slash AD Cousins. And that, that's where every, where all my stuff goes, actually. Right. And I've, I've seen some in some of your YouTube films descriptions, you've even given the entire workflow and formulae mm -hmm. that you've used, which is yeah. really going above and beyond. The, well, uh... <laughs> you, if you, we want people to, to, to be able to do this. You know, mm. when I started filming and buying expired uh, film, the first thing you do when you see it pop up on eBay is, okay, Kodakro, um, Kodak 2253, what's that like? Has anybody ever processed that? What results can I expect? And it was incredibly helpful to find footage produced by people showing that it could be done or, mm. you know, giving the, the details of how they did it. And um, so and I think that's a great, you know, that's a great way to proceed. Mm. It's the only way to guarantee that film can survive is to have um, people developing at home. It's as important as the labs, you know, to have a, a um, an ecosystem, if you like, of, of people who understand film and who process film and, uh, and understand, you know, the importance of film, um, it, you know, is really important. So, and you've got to help promote that. And mm. you know, the best way to do that is to arm people with as much of the information as, as, as you can give them about the best ways of doing things and what works, what don't work. And, yeah. And well, so thank God for the internet. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been, <laughs> even though the new technology killed Super 8, it's now helping it uh, come back. And um, thank you, Adrian, for joining me on this. Mm -hmm. I I could talk all afternoon, and indeed we have, uh, but um, this uh, this stream has got to end at some point, but not quite yet. But uh, anyway, go to go to eighty cousins on YouTube. Um, look up on um, on Vimeo as well. Adrian's films are always worth watching. Just don't expect your own development to be as as good as his first time round. Yeah. It's going to take a while. <laughs> anyway, thanks a lot for joining us, Adrian. All right, cheers. That was uh, Adrian Cousins. And now uh, we've uh, now we've let him go. I can get on to this week's questions. Yay! These are all questions that were typed up during the live chat. And we, uh, well, I, I often don't have time to look at the live chat during the show, but I am watch, reading them after the fact, and I have the questions here. So I'm going to rattle through these from uh, you lovely people who have been uh, watching and asking questions. Um, ben Reynolds asks, is that the regular Wolverine or the pro, Ben? My Wolverine is a pro. It takes 400 foot rolls and it scans at 1080p. Um, the regular one would probably give you about as good a, good a result as well. Do you develop reversal? I think we've answered that tonight. Yes, I do. Um, ben Reynolds also asks, I've sourced a Lomo tank, but I have no idea how to dry the film. Here's a tip. Okay, this costs three pounds on eBay. It is designed for hanging up uh, ties and socks and stuff in your cupboard. But it also hooks onto absolutely anything. If you get two of these and put them at separate ends of the room, you can uh, hang up your film from one side to the other. Sometimes I put a fan on it as well. Lovely jubbly, keeps it all off the ground. Very cheap way. There are these things called rotary film dryers as well, which is a kind of a drum that you wind the film around. Adrian's got one, of course. Um, what size of Lomo? I I have a couple. I have I have one that takes uh, thirty three foot lengths and another that takes fifty foot lengths. They're good for different uh, different reasons. Um, and now some. Um, <laughs> Some suggestions. I asked last week for some suggestions of uh, what I should shoot, and some have come on, it's come in. One, shoot a short on how to floss teeth on Super 8. Really? I don't know. That's kind of disgusting. But 
Maybe. I don't know. Wheelie bin animation, says Simon Porter. Wheelie bin animation. That's an interesting one. I might have a give that a go. Uh, Lyndon B says, how about a trip on a bus to a city slash town? That's so wholesome. That's so nice. The thing is, I live in a city slash town, so it would have to be a trip out of the city slash town, if that's all right, Lyndon. Maybe I'll do that with a uh, with a bit of a time lapse so we can uh, get a fast motion uh, trip. Um, Simon Porter asks, is it worth using 12 millimeter gaffer tape to seal Super 8 camera doors? Interesting question, that. It is something you tend to do with uh, 16 mil. He means like just making sure there's no light leaks, like getting in around these bits. I mean, go for it if you want. I've never had a light leak because of light coming in here. Something you want, might want to check out if you've got a camera is to, whoop, uh, along around this window, check the foam. Quite often the foam has deteriorated over the years and you might need to replace that. It's quite easy. You just need a scalpel and some foam packaging or something and cut, a, cut it and glue it back in there. If it's deteriorated, it is vaguely possible that light could sneak in through that window and then f and then uh, fog your uh, your film you can always uh, if you don't have any foam you can always just put some black gaffer right over that window oh by the way <laughs> now i've got this uh, canon up here here's an interesting fact uh, someone on the uh, on on facebook complained that uh, they were being harassed by the brazilian police for walking around with one of these cameras because from a distance it looked a little bit like a Mac 10 machine pistol. So uh, if you're in South America and you're waving one of these around, you know, just mind how you go. Might be cheaper to get a Mac 10 pistol. Right, uh, any more questions? Yes, one from uh, Benjamin R. Why does Super 8 drone footage look better than digital? He's referring to last week's show where we showed a bit of uh, drone footage. Maybe we can get that back here um, in uh, from last week's. Um, double eight, thank you, thank you. Miami 60, Pete Gomez. Oh, I don't seem to have it. Oh, here it is, here it is, drone video. I don't know how this is gonna come out, but Oh, there's too much stuff. Wait a minute, let's get rid of some of this stuff. There we go. So here's here's the drone video from last week. This was shot by Josh Hack. And my God, it looks good. Why does it look better than digital? Two words. Two words for you. And this is why film often looks better than digital uh, already uh, in, in any situation, not just drones. And the words were... Um, uh, oh, uh, dynamic range. That's it. Film has a di better dynamic range. Look it up. <laughs> That's why they uh, still use film cameras, 16 mil film cameras to film rockets taking off. Although they, that was the space shuttle. So maybe they're not anymore. Anyway, there's a great, there's a great video on YouTube by, um, uh, God, my mind's a blank. The, uh, the, 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 the big, the fat guy who's bald, he looks a bit like Buster Blood Vessel. Um, oh, I've, 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 I've blanked on it. But he's he's got a great film about um, the cameras that were used to film NASA launches and uh, why why they used 16 mil in the age of digital. Dynamic range, look it up. Uh, ben Reynolds asks, can you take us through your Kodachrome exposure and developing process at some point? I think we've covered that. I might go a bit more into reversal processing on another show. It's a bit complicated. And finally, Yusef Khan says, do you have any experience with Agfa cameras? A very timely question, because next week I will be talking Agfa cameras with Bill Rogers. And Agfa have had some absolutely astonishing camera designs over the years. And we'll be looking at a few of those. I'm looking forward to talking to Bill about those. And finally, it's time for the live Super 8 screening. Hurrah! Live Super 8. What I mean by that, of course, is that I have an actual Super 8 projector here. 
I have, oh, the DSLR's gone off. <laughs> I have a live piece of paper right here. Get rid of that. And I'm going to project from here to here. And we're going to be using sounds this time. And uh, I have gone and bought a new bulb for the projector. You might remember last week, I had a little disaster. Everything was ready to go, and then the bulb went. So give me a sec. I'm going to switch the lights off, and we'll have ourselves a little screening. All right. Let's just put, plug it in. Right, uh, now I've wired the sound directly into the desk. God knows how it's gonna sound, fingers crossed. Okay, this is my daughter Lily. She's gonna read us a poem. Hello, hello, hello. They fuck you up, your mum and dad. Fools in old style hats and coats, who half the time were soppy stern and half at one another's throats. Man's hands on misery to man, it deepens like a coastal shelf. Get out as early as you can. And don't have kids yourself. Oh, well, sorry about the, the sound, uh, on the sound sea, going there. Shining with all its might. Oh, that's me singing, it uh, singing to make reciting a, a bit of Morris and, and the Carpenter. And this was odd, because it was the middle of the night. The moon was shining sulkily because it thought the sun had to be there after the day was done. It's very rude of him, she said, to come and spoil the fun. The walrus and the carpenter walked on the brownie, <laughs> brownie beach. Okay, I, I think we've tested the uh, sound good enough, well enough now. It's been a lovely day. We've had some laughs. We've had some uh, tears. No, we haven't. And uh, we've uh, burned out a lot of very valuable Super 8 film from the uh, from 1998. And I hope we did it justice and uh, got some uh, some. Oh, <laughs> and it went. And I'll keep the keep it running to uh, show you some absolutely astonishingly bad development I did as the credits run. Oh my goodness, ladies and gentlemen, we have gone over. We are now at one and a half hours, the show. <laughs> the show's, show's getting longer and longer. But let's do this again next week, Thursday 29th of October. We'll be back. We'll be back with Bill Rogers. We're going to talk Agfas and uh, anything else I'll have put together. Thank you all for coming. Thanks for uh, all the comments and all the lovely thoughts that you've sent me and uh, all the questions. And we will do our best. I will do my best. There's no we involved here. I'm doing. I'm running the whole damn show here. So uh, <laughs> nice bit of larking, some people said. Yes. Damn right. And I, I don't mind there's a couple of swear words in there, because if I'm going to put swearing over the internet, then that Larkin poem is, is the one. Oh, right. Time for a, like I said last week, time to, to, to fall into a long, cold cocktail. And uh, we'll see you next week. And as for tonight, I will be sticking around online on the internet and uh, talking to anyone who's still got questions because you know it's never enough I want to talk Super 8 24 7 and I will do so if if uh, given the chance of course things like eating and sleeping come in uh, into play oh and finally I got a little uh, a little a little thank you for the end just before we sign off um. and I want to thank you all for uh, coming to Ben's camera show live here on well sorry do it let's do that again I had the uh, had the DSLR still on
Right, switch everything off. And here we go for the finale. And I want to thank you all for uh, coming to Ben's Camera Show live here on, well, not live, but on, uh, on Super 8 Sound Film. And um, yeah, it's been, a, uh, it's been an interesting week. It has indeed been an interesting week. And next week will be even better. <laughs> In more interesting, I don't know. I've, I've now lost the window that has the YouTube on it. There, I can end the stream. Ah, there we go. Okay, right. Bye, everyone. See you next week. Thanks for coming to Ben's Camera Show. Are you sure you want to end your stream? Yes, but I'll be back Thursday, 29th of October. Same time, same place. See ya.